OK, so I do not have any kind of bullet point list for what I'm going to talk about. This is going to be driven by you. What I'm going to do right now, though, is just kind of like scaffold an app and talk through it. And then we can do questions after that. Um, so NPM installed Express. Uh, remember, Express doesn't create actual servers. It is a way for us to handle requests that come into servers. The way we can create servers is like this. Uh, there's a built-in library in Node called HTTP. This library has a method create server. And then we can just say server on request. Provide a listener for that request event, which will receive a request object and then also an object called response, which allows us to send back responses. And then we can say server listen on a specific port. And then this function here gets called when that server is successfully listening. So listening on port 3001. All right. Um, so let, let's see what happens. If we just do this, rec URL, this is what's going to happen when we go to our site. I'm going to start it up. I'm going to say node server. Notice, once again, that there's no express here. No express. So I'm just going to go to localhost 3000. And oh, I'm sorry, 3001. And we get this here, right? Because the, the URL of our request is slash. We're just going to slash. If you don't provide anything at the end here, it's just slash. Uh, we can also try going to slash you know, jumps or something. And then we get the URL slash jumps. So any request that comes into our server gets handled by that on request method. And we could build servers, like I said, without express. We can start saying, OK, if rec URL is equal to slash, then we're going to say res write hello, and then res end, which will actually send a response back. We're going to open that up again. And uh, oops, that is not. And then we get hello, right? We get hello, right? No express yet. Also, like we can say, else if rec URL slash you know, jumps res write. Another page. Cool. Res end. Right? And also, if we try this, h1, another page. We want to send back some, some HTML. And we try that. So let's restart this server. We go to slash jumps. We get HTML. Cool. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Um, and then you build more pages, and they do more things, and then you do this stuff, and it all becomes part of this one big function right here. It all becomes part of this huge function. You're going to check for all these URLs. You're going to check for all these methods to those URLs. And then you're going to get to an unmanageable state of that function of being able to handle those requests, right? And you're going to start building utilities like Something that handles your routes, something that handles your responses, uh, different ways to respond with files and stuff like that. Um, and what you're basically going to end up doing is building Express, right? That's what Express is. It's a, a tool that allows us to handle requests, not build servers, not instantiate a server, because we've already done that, but handle a request. An Express app is just kind of like a fancy function. It's a fancy function that rec and res go into, and then it goes through all of your wh what I consider like your pipeline, your pipeline of middleware. So you create an Express app by getting the Express library and just invoking it like a function, and that gives you back an instantiation of an Express app, which Express app, once again, is just a function um, that makes your request go through a pipeline of other functions of middleware, OK? So let's do that. And in fact, I'm going to do this here, app, all right? All of this is going to stay in place. And right now, if 
I restart my server, I'm going to start doing this with nodemon. If I go to slash, I get cannot get slash, which is, this is already part of Express. This is Express doing this for us. I have not registered anything in Express to say, when I get slash, it does this. So Express receives the request. It gets thrown into here. It receives your requ the request and then throws it through a pipeline of middleware, which right now has nothing. There is no pipe right now. So what happens is when a request goes through the entire pipeline and it gets to the end and nothing happened to it, then th it's a 404. That's what happens. It's a 404. And that's, this is just default express functionality. It got to the end of the pipeline because there was no pipeline, and that's a 404. Same thing here if we just say slash Joe. Th I don't know what to do with that request, so 404. And you can see that message. You can see that here in your network tab. You're going to get very familiar with your network tab, especially when you start doing AJAX requests um, starting after Thanksgiving. But you can see. I go here and I get a 404 back, a status code 404. All right. So let's build something to handle a specific route. So we're going to say, all right, my first bit of middleware here is going to be app get slash. Now, this can also be accomplished by doing this. One thing that really makes the difference between like app get and app post and app use very clear is that you can think of app get, app post, app put, app delete, all of those different things as abstractions on top of app use. Okay? Let's talk about app use first. App use allows you to put in a function to be part of your pipeline that any request that goes through regardless of the method of that request, whether it was get, post, put, delete, whatever, or the URL of that request, will go through this function. It will go through this function. And it receives rec, res, and next in here. And you can do something. Like, I'm going to say rec uh, location is New York. I'm just going to put a little, uh, some, some property on here. I'm just going to put a string on this rec object. And then once I'm done doing that, I call next. Next is a function kind of like done in Mocha. It's a function that we have to invoke in order to tell Express this part of our pipeline here is done. And it should go to the next part of the pipeline. And here we're going to put more stuff in our pipeline. But I want to point out something to you. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. And you can see, still, there's a 404. Let's talk about that first. So when the request comes in, it goes into this middleware here. Stuff happens. And then next is called which means it goes down into this middleware. And stuff happens, and then next is called. And now, it Express knows that it got to the end of the middleware, and there was nothing afterwards, and it didn't respond in any way. Well, really, it, it didn't respond. Really, what I mean is if it gets to the end of the middleware, and the last thing in the pipe says go to the next thing, then that means that's a 404, which is why we're still getting cannot get slash. OK? So there's two components in our pipe right now. They both said go to the next thing. That means nothing handled this request, like nothing handled the response of this request. The other thing to point out here is here's the first pipe. Here's the first component in our pipe. And it set rec location to be a string called New York. And then it said go to the next thing. And it did. It went to the next thing. And this ran console log rec location. And it console logged out what we set as a string. What does this mean? What is the point of me showing that? Mark? It's the same request. Right. The rec object in every single part of the pipeline for a specific request is always the same thing. It's always the same object. Meaning if you attach properties like this here to that object, 
they will be accessible later on because it is the same object. And that's one of the major use cases for app use. Let me show you something that does this. That's body parser. npm install, I'm gonna install body parser. All right, and then I'm gonna put this in. I can say app use, well first of all, I can say body parser here, require body parser. I can say app use body parser, uh, and then I'll provide these two options. And it's not super important for you to like memorize these options. It's important for you to understand what body parser is doing. So now the first two components in our pipeline that every request goes through, because we're saying app use, this means regardless of method, regardless of URL, the request is gonna go through these components. Both of these components do th this. Basically, if it is a post or put request, meaning it can have a payload, a body attached to it, get and delete requests can't do that, by the way. Get and delete requests can't have that like little bit of data attached to it. Post and put can. If it is one of those kinds of requests, it's going to look at the body and parse it in whatever way it needs to and then attach it to rec.body. And you've used rec.body before, right? You use rec.body. That's the same thing that's happening here. Way more logic, but the same thing that's happening here. There is some kind of code running in this middleware then it figures out what it needs to attach to rec.body, just like we're doing rec location here. And then it says, okay, next, which is why later on in the pipeline, you can access rec.body, because something put it on there. In fact, I'm going to try to, as best I can, implement this. So let's see rec.body going in. Um, I'm gonna use Postman to get this done. Okay. Do I have Postman still? Um, yeah. So I'm just opening up an application. Um, it just allows me to make requests. This is kind of like curl, but in a, br a browser, in an app, okay? So don't, don't worry too much about what's going on here. Um, I'm just going to say, all right, I'm going to Post to local host 3000, which is what we're doing. Um, I can't really zoom in here. You're right, it is 3001, thank you. No, I don't want any of those. All right, I'm gonna make a post to 3001, all right? And I'm going to attach some kind of body. Uh, let's see how I can create a JSON body here. Yeah, there you go. I'm gonna attach some information here in JSON. I'm gonna say, all right, here's the JSON body. Let me make this a little bit bigger again. I can't really zoom in. I'm gonna say name, Joe, occupation, teacher, slash programmer, uh, and location, New Jersey. Okay, so that's cool. I'm gonna send this up to my server. It says it couldn't get any response, and that's fine. I'm not looking for a response. Oh, I'm not running my server. Okay, I'm gonna send it up again. And you can see, body parser receives that. It receives the JSON. It figures out what it needs to do with it, parses it, and puts it onto rec.body. And then we do this here and we get this console log. But now I'm going to comment these out, send it again, and now it's undefined. Rec.body's undefined. This is not something that's built into Express. This is something that a middleware function is figuring out. What we're gonna do is we are going to ourselves implement what's happening here. Okay, I'm gonna show you how this is implemented. So it's an app.use, meaning any request will do this, and we receive the rec, the res, and next, okay? 
And then I'm going to say if rec method is equal to post or rec method is equal to put, I'm going to do some stuff here. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, attached to the data of the request. Now, this is going to seem a little weird, but um, don't worry about it. <laughs> this is going to save, seem a little weird. But first of all, before I do that, if it's not a post or put request, that means there is no body that I could possibly parse, right? Only post and put requests can have bodies, payloads that are attached to them. So if it's not either of these things, what should I do? If it's not, if I have nothing to possibly parse in this body, what should I do? Huh? Yes, I should call next. I should say, okay, all's good here. I'm just going to call next. All right. What's that? A query? Mm. That's something that's built into Express. Body parser isn't doing rec query. That is just like part of the URL stuff. Okay, so now this is going to be the weird part, but I'll walk you through it. The way that data, um, the payload of a request comes in, is HTTP requests are kind of like streams. They're streams of packets, so they don't come in all at once. It's not like a big thing that just gets lifted in and then you have it. It kind of comes in bit by bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to say rec on data. So when a bit of that data comes in, bit by bit it comes in, we're going to take a look at that data and handle something. So we're going to say this for now. I just want to show you what happens. Okay? So we get that data coming in. And it's small enough that it all came in one chunk, but still it comes in this way. And it is, check it out, a buffer. Kind of like what we read from files, right? So it's just raw data. It's raw binary data. And if we two string this and try again, it is this string. This might look like an object, but it's not. It's just a string. It's a JSON string, OK? <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, var incoming JSON string up here. It's going to be equal to an empty string. And then as the data comes in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to append to this incoming JSON string the data coming in. Make sense? This right here is asynchronous, by the way. This, this uh, function here is asynchronous because it's an event listener. It's as the data is coming in, which is going to be later, call this function. And then we have another event we can listen to. We can say rec on n. No. In this case, that event will only get called if you successfully got data. There would be another event called error. Yeah. Which it would, error, it would have erred before you even got to this part if your request was erroring. But there is another event that you can hook onto called ends, which means that I am the request is done sending data. All of the data has been sent to me. And now what we can do is check out our full data string, our full incoming JSON string. We can send that request up again. And we have that full string. And what we want to do is we want to take this JSON string and turn it into an actual object. Who knows how to do that? Take a JSON string, turn it into a real object, a real JavaScript object. Because once again, although the console log doesn't differentiate because it actually turns it into a string, the type of this here is a string. So if I try to do dot name, I would get undefined. Yes? Yes, json.parse. So this is a built in. JavaScript function. So we're going to say console log json.parse that string. I'm going to show you the type of this. This turns it into an object. Okay? It's going to turn it into an object. So if I do j 
JSON parse this, and then I do dot name, we should get Joe. And we do. OK? So now, what I'm going to do is taking this object that I built from that JSON payload, I'm going to say rec body is equal to that. OK? And then, finally, I'm going to put what? Next, exactly. I'm going to say next, meaning, OK, this middleware has done its job. It waited for all the data to come in from the request. It received all that data and appended it to this string. And then once all that data was finished coming in, which took a while in computer time, it took a while. It wasn't as fast as the program could execute. It comes in over the network, and it's fairly slow. Finally, we get all of that data. We parse it using JSON parse. We parse this JSON string into an actual object. We set that to rec body, and we call next. And now, if we run this and make a request, oh, I forgot to take out the name property. Now, down here in our following part of our pipeline, rec body works the same exact way as we saw it work before. So we implemented the JSON body parser of rec body. It isn't exactly the way it implements it. It's a little bit more careful. I'm just assuming that the request is JSON if it's a post or put. Um, it won't necessarily be the case. But yes, does that clear up maybe a little bit about middleware? Yes. Um, oh, it's coming from oh, yeah. the request. It's the body of the request. Yeah, if we, um, yes, it's a post request. I'm going to open up, OK, I can't open up DevTools here because I'm in a Chrome app. But yes, it's a post request. It's a post request to localhost 3001. It can't be a get request because get requests can't have these bodies. If I switch this over to get, I'm pretty sure this application will get rid of me even trying to do that. Yeah, see? Like, I can't even click on body anymore. But post requests can have a body. And I say, this is some JSON text. It's just a string, but it's a, J it's a, it's a string that is JSON. And that's how I'm like parsing that. How that's all happening is not really important. What I wanted you to get out of that is here is a function doing a whole bunch of asynchronous work. And once it's done, it calls next. Or if it knows it doesn't have to do that work, if the method isn't post or put, and it knows it won't have a body, it can just call next and say, OK, go down the pipeline. This is, I'm not concerned with this request. Dan? Uh, what are you doing there after line 22? After line 22? Because that's not when I want to say next. I want to, this on data event, this is not super important for you to understand. But this on data event just gets fired when data is coming in from my request. I know all the data has been received by my server when the end event is fired. And I don't want to go down to the next component until I've set rec body. Tom? Yeah. 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 Right, when you're handling, when you're building actual request handling, like you do app get slash, you usually don't have to call next because that is like the final component that that request needs to specifically go to. Um, this is like, I mean, yeah, as you get better at Express, you need to understand this. But most of your actual request and handlers where they get responded to in those places usually don't have to call next because that's like where they end. That's all they have to go through. Well, and also when you have to throw errors down, right? Next with an error call, which we'll get to. OK, so that's how body parser is working. But really, I wanted to talk about next in that way because I kind of want everyone who's struggling with understanding middleware and express to kind of think of it the way I do, and that is as a pipeline of functions. When your request comes in, it goes through these functions in order. 
and each function has to say go to the next function in order for it to keep going. Yeah, David? I'm sorry this went over this already, but what's the difference between extended true and extended false? Um, I did not go over it, and honestly, I don't know. The docs will tell you. It has something to do with the headers that get sent up for specifically form URL encoded bodies. Um, it might have something to do with the format of that string that comes up. But yeah, I would look at the docs. Okay, so that's just general middleware. These app uses get called regardless of method, regardless of URL. But then you have the more typical middleware, like this, you know, get slash. And then that receive rec res next. Now, you can think of these kinds of middleware. I'm just going to line break here so I can center it. You can think of something that looks like this, this app get slash, as actually being like this. It's in regular app use. So every single method, every single request will call it, except at the top here it says if rec method is equal to get and rec URL is equal to slash. Else, next. Does that make sense? If the method and the URL do not match, if the method is not get or the URL is not slash, then this will get skipped. But it's still part of your pipeline. It still is like, it checks to see if it does match this. And you can think of this and really, actually, it is this. This is what's happening. If rec method is equal to get and the URL is slash, then you run code. And this is the same code here. Does that make sense? Yeah, Rafi? So, so that next example, um, you don't need to have that next to there. You do. You don't, have, you don't have, to, you have to save it explicitly for it to skip over to the next one. Yes, every single time. Yeah. Um, it's like if you list done as a parameter in your Mocha test and you just do synchronous things and you don't call done, it will just say it timed out. Next is made this way because it wants to be able to handle asynchronicity. Okay? It can't just run to the bottom of this function and, and, and assume that your middleware is actually done. Even when you call it synchronously, it needs to be called. You need to invoke next in order for it to go to the next thing. Yeah. Um, I thought the question was maybe about second slash or second net, but I was imagining a app like that. It depends. In this situation, what's the Well, if, yeah, it, it still, it depends. It depends on what's going on here, because you might need it for error handling. But it doesn't need to have next to get the, to get from the previous app that we were talking about. Um, I'm sorry, what? Line 20 to 25. Line 20 to 25. What? Yeah, like that jump is going to happen regardless of whether or not the next is passed to that. It's actually not. If I, if I do this, if I say res send hello, and then I go to here, I'm just going to get loading. And that's because I hit this middleware, the request method is get, and it is slash, and then nothing's happening here, and next isn't being called, which means it does not go down to here. It will only go down to this if this function up here calls next. If it doesn't call next, then it won't happen. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, basically. Yeah, right now. But this was just an, a, an example to know what's happening in that next one. Okay, so now it works like this. Okay, yeah, Rafi? Uh, so this is like a big one of the business systems. Mm -hmm. like, right, so when you use next in the second example, I'm sorry, that started at line 25, you're still only going to use that for error handling for the standard stuff? Yeah. I mean, it depends. It depends on how it's structured. But if your response is going to get generated here, most of the time, yeah, you don't want to go down anywhere. But let's say, let's say you have middleware down here that's like, 
OK. Uh, I'm going to write to like a logging.txt file. I'm going to write to a log file um, data about this request. I'm going to say like the, the IP of this request. OK? So this is something, this is fairly contrived, but let's say that every request that comes into your server, after that request has been responded to, you want to log the IP of that request into some kind of file. Right? So in order for this to happen here, you would have to say, OK, I'm sending a response to the request here, and then I'm going to call next, which means that it'll like say, OK, I'm done here. Let's go to the next part of the pipeline. That's not a very common thing to do. Usually when you have your actual request handler middleware, in this case, I'm handling this specific request and I'm responding to it, usually it doesn't have to call next for any reason. But in this case, it makes sense. But this would also just make sense to happen before any actual request handler. Like It's just easier that way. But yeah, usually you don't call next inside of a request handler. Not in this way, at least. You usually call it for an error handler, right? So let's talk about that. You usually put an error handler at the end of your pipeline. Okay? You kind of put it near the end or the last component. But the thing is, you can't think of it as being part of the same pipeline. It's kind of like the bad pipeline. It is if something calls next anywhere in your normal pipeline with an error, with an error as the first argument to next, it kind of switches to this bad pipeline and starts going through it. And the way you say, this is going to be in my bad pipeline, in my erroneous pipeline, is by providing four arguments here. You have to provide four explicit parameters. It does something similar to how Mocha knows that you have an asynchronous test. By providing done, it says, ooh, the length of this function is one. In this case, you provide four. You say, all right, error, rec, res, next. And you have to list all four. If you don't, it doesn't know the difference between this and a regular middleware. But by listing four parameters and the length of this function being four, it knows that this is an error handling middleware. So now, any regular middleware that calls next with any first argument, it doesn't have to be even an error object. It could be anything as a first argument that is truthy. If it's null, if it's undefined, then it would be the same. Um, but if you call it for anything here, it's basically going to say, OK, I'm going to basically skip all the next things, all everything after this, and go to the first error handling middleware. It's very similar to promises in that way, in which like when your promise rejects and throws an error, it skips all the success handlers and goes to the first error handler, right? It depends on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which we're gonna which we're gonna in, uh, implement soon, because we have to talk about mongoose as well. Yeah. Okay. But the other thing to note here is even though next is getting called, and let's put an actual error in here. Say new error, world exploded. It's my favorite error. Even though next is being called on line 16, line 17 still runs. Next is just a normal function. It does not stop the execution of your current function which means that this will still run. That's important. You, you need to understand that, because even if, so, if something goes wrong, you want to make sure that all of the things that were supposed to happen when it goes right don't actually run, because then they, they won't work. It won't be valid. So you want to say, basically, like if you have an error, you like return it, right? Like you, or you say, based on an if statement. We don't have any conditional here. But we're going to do this a little bit more once we implement Mongoose. Lily, you have a question? I believe so. I'm not, I'm not completely sure, but usually like, you don't even do that. I've never seen a use case for that, and I wrote Express for two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I think maybe. I'm not sure. OK, so let's do some mongoose now. 
I'm going to implement into this current server something mongoosey. So first, uh, I'm going to create a, a models.js file. Models.js. Um, we have to npm install mongoose. We're going to do that. Save mongoose. Uh, and then as that's installing, I'm going to start writing this file. So mongoose here. Um, first thing we need to do with mongoose is we need to connect to Mongo, a MongoDB instance. Um, this is not something you're going to need to know for your assessment specifically. Uh, the scaffolding will be there, and the connection will already be there once you start working on it. But it's important to understand what is going on. Let me make sure that my Mongo is running first. It is. I'll start this up again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say mongoose connect. And MongoDB, by default, runs on your local host port 27017. Um, it also knows that that's the default port, so you don't necessarily have to include it. But it's not always necessarily on that port. And then you say slash, and then the database name. I'm going to call this mongoose, Q, mongoose express QA. That's going to be the name of my database. Okay. So I connect there. Um, and then I'm just going to say mongoose connection on error. And then it'll just receive that error, console error, error. This is just me checking to make sure that if it doesn't connect successfully, I know why. I'm looking at the error, what happened. And then that's it. Okay, That's it. And that'll create a connection. So what we need to do is, in order to have that work, I'm going to require in our models file. Say current directory models. Now this is a file and not a uh, directory. It's just models.js. So I'm saying current directory of server.js models. And this will run that file. And let me make sure it connects successfully. So I don't see an error, which means it does. I can also say on open, which means it successfully opens. I can say connection to database successful. Cool. Connection to database successful. Yeah, David? I don't know. Most the easiest way to do that is just say console log arguments. No, it does not. Yeah, because I mean there is no payload to that event. It just means I opened. Right. Yeah. Uh, Rafi. Um, whenever you require uh, a file, it runs that file and figures out what it needs to module exports. If you do not sp uh, specify a module exports, do you remember what it exports by default? Let me do that again. It's so cramped. So, so module is like any other object in JavaScript. It's just meant for a specific file. It's kind of like a global, but to a file. Um, and the exports starts off by default as an empty object. And then you reassign that, or you add properties to it, or whatever. And then that's what gets required in on the other end. So in this case, var models inside of here is going to be an empty object. In fact, the same object, the same empty object as the one that was listed as the export. OK. So that's running. Let's create a model. I'm going to create a product model. It's kind of my, my go-to my go to dry example here. Uh, so I'm going to say product schema, var product schema. So a schema, a schema is a blueprint for what a model should be. It, describes what documents it for that model should look like. It describes all the utilities that that model will contain, the statics and the methods for those instances, the virtuals, all that stuff. 
The schema is the blueprints. So I'm going to say new mongoose schema. Okay, so you're creating a mongoose schema. This is just a constructor function here. And I'm passing in what this product should look like. So I would say the product needs a name. And it's going to be type string. Say it needs a price. I'm going to say that is type number. I'm going to say it needs to say whether or not it's in stock. And that's going to be type Boolean. It's either going to be yes in stock or no in stock, so true or false. I'm going to say that it needs um, maybe a quantity. A quantity, so um, type number here. How many of these do we have in stock if we do? Um, we could also probably, yeah, let's do that actually. I'm going to get rid of in stock here. So we have a name, we have a price, and how many we have. Okay? I'm going to say this name is required for sure. Let's say required true. The price, um, I would say that the minimum price should be zero, right? I don't think we should sell anything for negative money. Um, and this should also be required. And then the quantity, the minimum, should also be zero. We shouldn't be in debt for our own product. Okay? These are extra validations that you haven't worked with, but it basically means here's a number, and if a number is put in as the value of this and it's less than zero, then this will be invalid, right? And we'll get that validation error. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to set up a virtual. I'm going to set up a virtual that is called, I'm going to say product schema virtual. This is a virtual property. I'm going to call this in stock. And when I access in stock, does anybody see where I'm going with this? Michael, you do? <laughs> okay, where, where am I going? Right, I'm doing that as a virtual. I'm saying when I try to access in stock, what it's actually going to do is it's going to access the quantity of the instance I'm working off of this specific product. And if the quantity is greater than zero, then I return true. Right? So I can just do that. Return this quantity is greater than zero. And if it is, that means in stock, and that will be true. Otherwise, it will be false. Cat? No, they can be setters as well. Yeah, you could also do this. Um, it doesn't really make sense for in stock, but you could do this. You can say virtual in stock set. So now if somebody says like a product that they have access to in stock is equal to true, what you're going to get here is you're going to receive the value that's being set to it. So this would be true, this value here. You receive it as a parameter to the function. And then you can say if val is equal to true, which is just that, then you can say this quantity equals 1. That doesn't really make sense. But it totally makes sense for this. If the value is false, if somebody says a product in stock is false, you can say pretty confidently this quantity is 0. right? So that's what a virtual, how a virtual works for setting, as opposed to getting. Whenever it that property gets set. It doesn't actually set that property. It actually just calls this function. OK. So uh, this is cool so far. We're going to stick with this. And I'm going to um, turn, take this schema, take this blueprint, and create something out of it. I'm going to create the tool. I'm going to create the thing that we actually use, and that is the model. I'm going to say product. And the convention for naming a model is you kind of name it with a capital P, like a constructor function, because it kind of acts that way as a constructor for instances of products. I'm going to say var product is equal to mongoose model. I'm going to name the model. This is important. In fact, you know what I'm going to do first? I'm going to say puppy instead of product. But it's going to be based off of the product schema. 
Okay? It's going to be based off of this product schema, which although everything about it is a product like price and name and in stock and this virtual, nothing says this is a product. There's nothing saying that it's a product. In fact, it's a puppy. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this product model and I'm going to create a record. I'm going to say name blender price 2000 bucks uh, and we have quantity quantity we have 5 of these okay yeah i'm going to show you so once now i cr create this it actually went and it ran this i'm going to open up my mongo shell i'm going to use the database i'm using mongoose express let me make this larger my bad I'm going to use Mongoose Express QA. That is the name of the database I want to use. Uh, and let's look at the collections. Because we named the Mongoose model with the string puppy and not product, that becomes the name of our collection. That's how it puts that stuff into MongoDB now. It says puppies. Not products, but puppies. Because that's what we named it. There's nothing else about this that says that this is a product. This name is important. This name is important. If we change this to product now, we're going to rerun our server. Oh, it already reran. Uh, so let's go back into MongoDB and show collections. Sorry, this did not run again. Now, we have products because we named the model that way. That's, that's what the name is for. One of the reasons why you put that name there of Mongoose model product. It becomes the name of this here. Um, and also, when it goes to query it, it knows what collection it needs to query because it's, it matches the name, pluralized. Um, also, it is important for references, which we may or may not have time to get to. Probably not. Michael? Because there was already a record added in oh. from before. Yeah. Like it doesn't like wipe the database when we start the server. Cat? So like when you do this, does it always like the Yes, aside from that, there's no difference. We have dishwasher. It is a thousand bucks, and we have one of them. I don't know the actual, like, this is not the prices, right? right? <laughs> yeah, me neither. They always just come with the place I get. <laughs> I never bought one myself. 3,000? Oh, 50,000? 50 euros. Oh, Germany. OK, um, if we look into products, if we say DB products find, we only have Blender. We do not have dishwasher. Because by doing this, new product, remember, it does not save it to the database. It does not save it to the database. This, this makes it an object in JavaScript. It gives you an instance of dishwasher which is not actually in your database until you do save. And remember that this is asynchronous and returns a promise. So you can say, <laughs> dishwasher, save. It is not true with product.create, because product.create is an alias for creating a new product this way and calling save. Yes, product.create will actually put it in the database immediately. And it returns a <coughs> promise that will let you know when it's in the bit database. So now if we do this, it's inside of our database. Um, you don't use that promise call, and you just call save, it'll still it'll still, right? it'll still save it. You just won't know one if when when it's actually saved in the database without registering a callback, and you won't also know two if it went wrong. Okay. Yeah. Like that is always a uh, 
that it's always something that could happen. So if we do this here, let's do this. Let's change this to um, fridge. Call this fridge. Uh, this is pretty close, right? OK. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because we're going to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of the price. And I'm going to try to save this fridge. And here we go. I'm going to call it. And yeah, successful. Great. Cool. It's not in there. And that's because the validation broke, right? The validation went wrong because we didn't provide a price, but we're not looking for the error. We're not handling the errors. So as far as we know, everything went fine. I, we know that it didn't go fine because we don't see it in our database. And also, dishwasher save, which should really be fridge save, was never called. If we run this again, if I just like restart this, you can see fridge save never gets called because there's no success handler. Because actually, it goes into here. Um, I'm going to do it this way, null. It goes into here and lets us know what went wrong. And that is that price is required. So without doing that, then you don't know when it goes wrong, which is why you should always, even if you save and you don't care when it is over, you should at least check for that error. Lily? Um, mm -hmm. uh, is a specific product. Yes. Yes. Because the model itself here, if we do product.quantity, that doesn't make any sense. Because this is a tool for us to manage and query and create new products. In this case, it is the context is an instance. And in the case of virtuals, hooks, and methods, the context, the this keyword, matches up to the instance, a specific product, fridge, dishwasher, blender. The only time it's different is in a static. A static is called right off of the model tool itself and it's meant to like build custom queries and like have specific tools and in that case this is not an instance but the model itself yeah so if quantity is not required then no. your min is at zero does min act like a default if you don't provide a quantity i don't believe so i don't believe so let's let's see what happens that's a great question i don't know the answer to it Uh, no, it does not. It just doesn't put it in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So min means if you provide a number less than zero, then that's invalid. But if you provide nothing, that's also OK. okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's called default. Okay. Yeah, you can say default one or something like that. Uh, and we can, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the fridge that exists now. And then run this again. And now you can see default is quantity one. OK, I'm, uh, I, yes, I, want, I would love to answer your questions, but I want to show one more thing, unfortunately. Um, I want to show the integration of using this product model with our route. OK, so now. We have to make sure that this, first of all, exports something. So what we're going to do is we're going to say module exports. It ex exports an object. I'm going to have the object's key be product. Uh, don't get confused about this. This is a kind of like a string, right? This is just the name of the key. And then product here is the model. So let's we can make this a little bit more clear by saying like product model, OK? And then here I'm going to say that our product model, product, is equal to uh, models product model. Okay? And now when we get here, when we do this, we're going to say product find, and this is going to bring back all of our products. This should be exec. This returns a promise, and the promise will resolve to the products found or will handle an error. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put in this here. I'm going to say if there's an error, if this gets called, I'm just going to call next with this error. Yeah. So it'll go down to our error handling middleware. 
Uh, the quick way of doing this is just by saying next. OK, so now we have our products here. And I'm going to say res send products. I'm not sending it back HTML. I'm just sending back the array of products itself, which Express will say, ooh, you're sending back an array. That means you probably want to send back JSON, which is what happens. This is the same thing as saying res JSON. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do this here. And uh, I need to restart my server. And now, ooh, see, this is why we catch errors. Cannot f read property find of undefined. Ooh, what did I do wrong? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, thank you. I tried to make it more clear, and I confused myself. But now we refresh, and we get all of our products. The last thing I want to show, and I want to do this quickly, is I want to show what you would do to get a specific product based on the URL. You could say here, product name. Provide a parameter. This is rec.param. So by putting a parameter here with a colon, this makes the, that part of the URL dynamic, meaning any could go, anything could go after that slash, and it's going to be assumed to be a product name. And what we're going to do is instead of finding all the products, we're going to find one product with the name rec params product name. Rec params is an object that gets filled in with the values that are in those dynamic portions of the URL. And those values are keyed by what you call that dynamic portion. So in this case, whatever goes after that slash now is going to be keyed on this object as product name. So we go do that. We find one, and we say product here. Now, if we give the name of a product that doesn't exist, what we want to do is say, if product is equal to null, res status 404, and we're going to send that ain't no product. Otherwise, we want to send back that product. All right? And now, if we refresh our server, this still one still works. And then if we go to slash blender, see we're going to slash blender, it will just send back the blender. But if we go to slash puppy bowl, we get a 404 because it queries our database for the products with the name puppy bowl, doesn't find one, and we get a 404 response that says that. OK? So that's all the time we have. Thank you for coming early. Um, I will send this code out. I made the recording as well, which I'll encode and upload ASAP. Um, remember that there are videos inside of that workshop on learn.now. It's called Express slash Mongoose Assessment Prep. Those videos and those concepts match pretty closely to what you need to know for the assessment tomorrow. Okay, So make sure you watch those. And if you have questions about them, let me know. Um, and OK, thank you.